Welcome to the Pigeon River Farm, doing farming right. I'm Robert Brown, the owner of Pigeon River Farm. Thank you for viewing. Well, good evening. In tonight's episode, we're going to talk about a trip that I was just on. I went to the Grassworks Conference, something I enjoy every year, a wealth of knowledge. I wanted to share some of the experiences I had there with the audience. I had a chance to videotape a couple of the presentations per the presenter's authorization. And I got some great information. Uh, the first one here that we're going to do here is we had Dr. Breckner. Uh, he's a veterinarian, a very experienced veterinarian. Uh, works for Organic Valley. And so brought on a wealth of knowledge. I gobbled it all up. Uh, one of the main areas that he talked about was, was health, of course, of uh, ruminants on pasture and kind of all the things that can go wrong. And I've had some of these experiences. Specific thing that I got out of this was the area discussion on bloat. Uh, that's where an animal draws in too much, eats in too much uh, greens, and it basically ferments in the in the first stomach and basically turns into, well, as he'll explain, a foam. So even some of the wives' tales that I had been exposed to um, are definitely a do not, and he explained why. So it is uh, going to be kind of uh, about an hour long very informational and I hope that you really enjoy it. Uh, so we'll start uh, the featured film. Everybody Thank to our session this morning. Uh, there's uh, <clears throat> cold water there if you need a drink. The bathrooms or restrooms are out in the hall. And uh, we have the good fortune to have uh, Greg with us this morning. I'm going to let him introduce himself. But he's uh, working currently with Organic Valley. He's a veterinarian and he's going to give us some great insights into uh, health and disease issues that we want to be aware of as grazers. He has his own grazing operation with his family and I think we're just fortunate to have him with us this morning. So you are invited to ask questions as we go along and uh, if there's any issues that we uh, need input on I guess we'll point a finger yeah. and say. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to you Greg. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, flag me down with questions as we go. Um, yep, my name is Greg Brickner. I live uh, in Waniwak, Wisconsin. It's about 45 minutes straight west of here. Um, this where I'm going to be starting my 36th season of, uh, of uh, grazing this year. Uh, I was very fortunate when I was young to, to be a, a farmhand for an expat New Zealander. And so I learned from the very beginning uh, how to do it well, and I've just been really fortunate. Uh, my family and I, we've also milked cows, and for the last probably close to 15 years, we've had a flock of sheep then. So I deal with both uh, cow and sheep and any grazing uh, ruminant questions uh, that you might think about. I'm basing the topics in this talk on the questions that come up most frequently or that I had to deal with when I was in practice then. So I don't want to give a huge laundry list, so I'm going to try and keep it focused on the, the big issues then. Okay, so we're going to start with the, the plant-related problems during the grazing season, and they are bloat, nitrate poisoning and prussic acid poisoning, and grass tetany. Bloat. Um, sometimes this is even just getting the diagnosis right is, is difficult then. So bloat, it's uh, a buildup of gas in the rumen. The rumen is on the left side of that animal. So you see this, this right here. Uh, some people, cows will eat a whole bunch. They'll have a really palatable pasture and they'll fill up and people will be like, oh, are they bloated or not? Bloat is, is gas and so it's gonna rise and float hot air, and so you see this, this uh, bulge up high on the left side, so that is what bloat is. The other thing that it does, the thing that, that kills animals with bloat, is it puts too much pressure on their diaphragm and they can't, they can't breathe anymore. They essentially suffocate because of that. And so we look for this, this rise on the left side and then breathing distress. And sometimes deciding whether or not to, to treat an animal that you see is bloated, depends on the level of breathing stress. So I would, I, in my own experience, I'd have a cow come in that you know, looked a lot like this, but she wasn't having difficulty breathing. I would just leave 
leave that animal or the herd off a of pasture a while, let them work through it, uh, relieve some of that gas before I turn them back out again. So uh, how, how extreme we get in our treatment depends on these symptoms. That, uh, but that's, that's the big part is making sure that we're dealing with load to begin with. And, uh, Was the cow on the right loaded? <clears throat> Yes, and again, that's that is on that's on her left side. You see, the the right side uh, doesn't have that bulge on it. They look quite; those two sides will look quite different then. So, what's happening in bloat is uh, at least bloat on pasture is that we've got this foam formed, uh, and we get the stable foam that uh, can form because there's certain compounds in the in the uh, legumes most uh, uh, commonly, but sometimes we can get the grasses that do this too. Once we get this foam in here, now that cow, she can't belch up the foam then. It needs to be free gas in order for her to belch then. And so because she can't belch, it just continues to build up then. And this is what it looks like inside of this, this animal. It's just, again, it's just this foam that doesn't move. And I'm gonna come back to this later, but People are always thinking that they need to stick a needle in that or to, or to cut it open. But even if you stick a needle in it, there's no way this goo is gonna come out that little hole then. So uh, don't stick things in the side of the cow then, no matter how tempting it might be. What we've gotta do is, is uh, break up the, those foam bubbles then. And so we can use uh, detergent, that's what this TheraBloat is. Um, oil also works. Uh, butter is an oil and it works as well. Um, it, mineral oil would be my first choice, it's inert. Uh, butter would be my second, it's a, a saturated uh, fat. And uh, vegetable oil would be my last, my last choice because it's an unsaturated and it does break up the bubbles but it's also toxic to the bacteria that are in the rumen too and so it kind of messes things up. So if we can just use mineral oil or this TheraBloat uh, those would be my first choices. And make sure you have these on hand then. It, it, it doesn't do any good if you know what to treat them with, but you don't have it uh, in, in the barn or in your cabinet then. So we have an animal that's, that's uh, uh, filled up on her left side and she's having difficulty breathing. The first thing we want to do is administer one of these things and then just give it time for those bubbles to break up. After we give it maybe you know 15 minutes, half hour, uh, maybe now if we need to, uh, the vet or you can uh, stick a hose down into their rumen and try to relieve some of that. Hopefully that that free gas that's formed then. Okay. How long after eating does it take for the bloat symptoms or the the bulging and stuff like that to, to be to be observable? Yeah, it can be how quickly it does it take to, to start to see bloat. And it can be very quick then, you know, a half hour, an hour even after a really, like say after you turn them onto a frosted alfalfa pasture, um, it can happen quite quickly then, so, yeah. Will you be talking about bloat prevention at all? Yes. Okay, great, yeah. thanks. <clears throat> yeah. It's a drench. So the butter, uh, if you have a, a, a frozen stick of butter and you can put it into a balling gun, you know, kind of cram it in there, that works pretty well. A frozen stick uh, is, is way easier than obviously one that's soft then. So yeah, that's how we administer that. And the oil is just, oil or the TheraBloat is just a drench, about a pint uh, will do it then. So what do you call that? Top of the this this is this brand name is called TheraBloat T H E R A dash bloat, and you should be able to get it at Farm and Fleet or your vet or wherever. Then it's just a little tiny bottle. You dilute it out into some water, and again drench him drench him with that. And it's a detergent then. Yes. Do sheep present similarly to cows or not? They they do. Yep, they'll present similarly then. The one side higher. Yep, one side higher. Yep. The same side. The same side. Yep, they're all they're all rumens, so that rumen all always lives on the left side of the animal. Then, yeah. <clears throat> again, um, using a needle or a knife is really not an option, even though you may think it's an option. Or have read read this, and the reason why here's the rumen inside that animal's abdomen, 
and here's the skin and muscle wall, but there's a space here uh, between them. And if we, if we create a hole and some of that rumen fluid comes out of that hole, it's going to go down into their abdomen uh, around the intestines. We get peritonitis. And rather than dying quickly from bloat, they die a slow and painful death from peritonitis. Um, so it, it's just really not even an option then. E even as a vet, it, I know that sticking, sticking a, a, a tube in there, doing anything like that, is just not, uh, not going to be helpful then. Okay, prevention. Um, you know, sometimes we have, we know that we've got uh, feeds that are going to be a, a bloat threat. Uh, a couple things we can do. One is limit the area that these animals have to graze on because it's the, if the leaves at the very tip, those are often the, the ones that get frosted and the, they contain the most of the compounds. If we limit this area, we make them graze down lower onto that plant, essentially diluting out all of those, those leaves that cause the most trouble. Uh, if we turn them into a big field, they're going to go along and nip the tops of all these plants and just exacerbate the problem then. So squeeze them into a small area, make them eat the entire plant before they get moved on. Another thing that's really, really useful and underused is pre-clipping. So we can take a clover alfalfa field, clip it, let it wilt slightly in the windrow, and a lot of that bloatogenic uh, compound, uh, it, it, it uh, we, we reduce the risk quite a lot. So pre-clipping before they go into, into a, say, a frosted clover alfalfa field uh, can go a long ways toward preventing it. Are you better off to turn around in the afternoon versus the morning then? It doesn't really matter. It's just the wilting action then, and it doesn't even necessarily take very long. I was thinking the top one where there's frost and you're turning it into another pasture. Yeah, it would be mostly because it's really wet then too. Uh, so it'd be nice if that frost or dew came off of it first then. Uh, but animals eat, uh, if you lay, if you just cut this with a sickle bar or just your hay buying uh, and leave it in the windrow, they, they eat it really quite well then. Uh, if you cut this with a, um, a bush hog, they don't like that, that tearing and uh, action on it and they don't tend to like those forages as well then. But just, even just a little bit of uh, wilting is fine then. <clears throat> there are some, uh, some products we can uh, feed to, uh, if we're mm -hmm. in a, one of those time periods when we uh, are at risk and they, they contain those, uh, those therabloat type detergents in it. Rumensin also happens to uh, prevent or uh, reduce the risk of bloat uh, then. <coughs> The problem with rumensin is that there's sort of an adaptation period, so it's not like you can just throw a bunch of feed with rumensin in all of a sudden and, and prevent it. You may throw them off feed for other reasons then. So these, these blocks here might be more, more useful then. All right. Any more questions about bloat? Yeah. If you're like feeding one of the preventative type things, is that going to affect the digestibility as a whole for them because it's going to kind of mess with their gut? Right. No, they, they're... Generally, they're, they may have some small effect, but uh, it's not considered usually a problem. The, the biggest problem with these is, is the expense then, so uh, they, they can be quite expensive to feed these. So. I was going to ask you, oh, go ahead, or is there anything you could do if you knew a frost was coming, like in your water system, is there anything you can add, a buffer or a, like a ACV or... Like that. Yeah, um, does that make it worse? That's not going to help at all. Then, so you can put those that detergent into a, a fixed water supply, not into an right. automatic fountain. Then, so you can you can do that. Then, uh, if it's coming, if you I, you know I, again, the, the cheapest way is going to be those those ways of manipulating the forage, tightening it down, feeding something in addition to it to kind of dilute it out. Um, uh, or, or clipping it then, so, yeah. So did you say how far in advance it like, you cut for a couple hours? A couple hours, just if we get some wilting, that's, that's uh, enough then. And if you've got, uh, if you're going to, um, if you've got several days of clear weather, you could cut a couple days uh, uh, worth of feed in, at one time, and uh, it'll, it'll last in the windrow for a couple days, so you don't have to go out there every day. 
and hopefully you wouldn't have to do it for very many days before you get through that risk <coughs> area to uh, that. Uh, as far as like like younger calves, you take them up past you, you put them in the feedlot, you're starting to give them grain. Is there a different treatment for grain blowing or? Yeah, it, uh, it's it's kind of the same. Um, they we do get these stable foams when they're. Uh, so this is when you're taking animals from pasture on and putting them onto a grain feed. Sometimes with, if an animal eats too much grain early on, they're not adapted yet, they can get a bloat. And we are getting a foam form from that as well. That same treatment. Same, similar treatment then, if it, in that acute case. Um, sometimes we can get a bloat from kind of a, a chronic rumen malfunction and that's a different that's a different situation that's usually a single or few animals at a time but but i treat fast? it the same then do they die fast from that you said a chronic condition that's a more of a slow yeah, I mean, a slow I problem because oh, okay, yeah. i had some drop dead two hours <laughs> yeah no that's that's the acute feed related yeah. one that that these that these treatments would work on yeah <clears throat> it's probably worth noting that sometimes bloat can be caused by um, pneumonia um, with a vagal nerve issue and if the cow doesn't start to look better after a short part yeah of that's that's sort of the, the the more chronic one where you know animals have been on feed for a long time so we can also get bloats that are not caused by that stable foam we can get it what we call a free gas bloat where the nerves are not working well in the rumen and it can be because of secondary to pneumonia or if they've had some ruminitis if they've been on feed um, and they will be bloated. They don't normally die from it. They'd be quite uncomfortable and, and slowly fade. And that's that's a kind of a veterinary uh, issue to to deal with then. Yeah. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Yeah. Then then you then we're talking about. You know, antibiotics, anti-inflammatories. It's sort of a, a it look it presents the same, but you know the approach is different. Then it's not something you're going to see on pasture. I thought it was easy because my son gave him grain four or five weeks and gone for the okay. Yeah. When I got more into it, it wasn't bad at all. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a, a tool, a device for shoving that stick of butter down the door of a cow? Yeah, you can use a balling gun. Actually, you may have to you may have to shave the butter, sh shove it in there, uh, those sharp corners. But usually, a regular balling gun will kind of get it in there enough to so that you don't have to stick your hand down the cow's mouth. Then, okay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. okay, nitrate toxicity and prussic acid. So these are different compounds, but they often get lumped together and kind of confused too because they're they present kind of in the same way in the same in similar plants so if we're grazing corn or sorghum sudan uh, a lot of these species present these same risks and they show up the same too so these are they have compounds that affect how well the red blood cells can carry oxygen and so these animals die quickly essentially suffocating again too we're not getting oxygen uh, circulating around. Uh, discussions about treatment of these I, I find pretty not useful then because it happens so quick that treatment usually isn't even an option and the, the few compounds that you can use to treat them are not readily accessible. They're not something your vet's going to have on the truck then either. So we're going to focus on prevention and thinking about uh, what are our risks uh, involved with that. So we're going to start with nitrate toxicity, and again, the mechanism is they just they they uh, inhibit how well our red blood cells can carry uh, uh, oxygen. And what happens in nitrate toxicity? Um, those nitrates get uh, taken up into plants that have uh, previous are, are stressed or were previously stressed. They take up a lot of that nitrate uh, nitrogen that's in the soil. But rather than turning it into more plant or plant protein, it just sits there as nitrates in the plant. So, so stressed corn, famously, uh, we can have drought stressed corn and then we get a rain. All of a sudden that plant takes up a whole bunch of the nitrogen that's in the soil 
uh, but because it's been stressed and it, it takes it a while before it starts uh, metabolizing it. In the meantime, that nitrate just sits, sits in the stems and when we chop it and feed it or the animals graze it, they get too much of that nitrate. Uh, that's the typical situation we think of. We can also get it early in the spring. We've, uh, you know, especially with annuals like uh, rye or uh, our festulolium or rye grass uh, that we've put lots of fertility on, but it's, it's been really cloudy and cold for a long time. Uh, those plants are just kind of sitting there. They're not doing a lot of uh, uh, metabolizing and using that that nitrate, but they're taking it up then. So we've got that. That's another risk period. So by inference, not an issue with perennials. It's generally not an issue with perennials, and uh, I, I okay. am going to make that that point. Then there's a maybe a small chance if you had you know a, a really pure stand of perennial ryegrass, you could potentially build it up. But this is these are this nitrate and prussic acid are, are problems of annuals. That's right. Good point. What's, yeah. what's a period from a uh, drought situation, you get a rain, how long before the uh, process gets going? To, to kind of depends how well they're doing, but it's going to take probably a couple weeks then. Oh, that's yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And the, the thing about the nitrates too is that they will, oopsie, they'll persist in those, those stems if you were to chop this corn right now, right afterwards, you're trying to salvage it, that those nitrates come with that plant. So you'll want to test the forage then. So like if you're putting in a silo, if you're putting in a silo, it? right. Does right. this in siloing reduce you, you can it? test for it. So the thing to keep in mind is that you, you can test test for these. Um, that's the other point. We tend you know, we're talking about this in February and you know the risk isn't gonna happen until summertime. What I think It'd be nice, to, you know, whenever you're planting uh, one of these summer annuals for grazing, um, is to kind of when you're when you're planting it, kind of refresh uh, yourself. Maybe pull up a, uh, uh, <coughs> something on the web, or if you have a little pamphlet, and just refresh yourself as to what the risks are and, and under what conditions. That. Prussic acid or cyanide. Um, so. This is uh, different than the nitrates in that this is a gas. And um, uh, so we can, if, if we harvest it or clip it, we can, we can get this gas to dissipate. But what's happening is these uh, animals eat this compound, they chew it up and in the room and it becomes uh, cyanide uh, gas and uh, we, get, we get poisoning from that. Then. Uh, the, the plants that are most at risk uh, for this are the sorghums and sorghum sedan crosses. Um, there's lots of warnings about not grazing plants below when they're uh, less than 18 inches tall and also uh, avoiding uh, stress, stressed plants as well then. So they're at most risk. Sudan grass has a lot less risk of it then. Um, uh, not 100% not safe, but you start to get into millets, pearl millets, uh, taff, Grazing corn, uh, they've got zero risk then. So, uh, if you're worried about it or you've had an experience in the past, you just want to avoid it. Uh, mostly, just by avoiding the sorghum and sorghum sedans, you get rid of most of that risk then. So, so it happen more all season long, or just in the fall, or just? So the the uh, the risk times are uh, where we're grazing it early. Don't go into it too early. The other problem here is you don't want to set stock this. You want to keep them moving because if you leave them on uh, a sorghum sudan pasture, they graze stuff that's uh, over 18 inches tall, but we start to get regrowth right away. And the cows are going to go back and start to graze that regrowth. And that's, that's a really high risk uh, bit of plant material. So you want to use rotational grazing with this. Yes? Oh, okay. They went. They went back and grazed the regrowth. Then. Yeah, exactly that. Um, and then after these plants get frosted, they're they're at particular risk then too. And if we can wait, usually it takes about seven to ten days. But once those leaves are are dried down, they're brown. They're not that uh, pale green. 
they're safe to graze again. And there's a fair bit of energy in those, those dried uh, sorghum sedan leaves, and so it's worth grazing. But just make sure we give it enough time, again, for that, those gases to, to leave then. Um, that's, uh, if, if you're, so if you're concerned about, you know, you've got some sorghum sedan and you're concerned about, is it potentially a risk then? Uh, you, don't, you don't know whether to turn your animals out or not. Um, well, I, I should just, uh, real quick, so I've been talking about these annuals. Cherry trees, uh, in particular, have uh, a lot of this compound in them. And if you get a windfall cherry tree in your pasture, um, it's, it could be a real problem. So you'll want to, if, if you get a bad storm and uh, a cherry tree gets knocked down in the pasture, you'll want to keep the animals away from that. It can, it can cause the same troubles as sorghum sedan. So that's the, the one uh, caveat to the annuals then. Something to keep in mind. Yes? So this It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, a compound produced by those particular species of plants. Then, so it is. Have, I mean, I, I have this, this scenario that she talked about about the cans go back to grazing. Yeah. I, I did that all last summer and I never had a problem and I never thought about it. Right. They must have been. It must just not have been enough to 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 kill them then. But they were getting some cyanide, just not enough to kill them then. So. Um, but it, it is, it's, it's not, it's not uh, you can have perfectly healthy plants growing and they will uh, cause this trouble then, so if they're on stage. If this ends up cut and then dry feed, is it, it better? Or yes, it? so if you can cut this and let it lay, again it's a gas. If, when, we, when, we, uh, when we disturb that leaf, that's when that compound is released then. So that's why when the cow chews it, she's uh, breaking up that leaf and, and releasing all this compound. But because it's a gas, it quickly dissipates. So if you wanted to, you could harvest this uh, and, uh, and sile it, uh, and, and that you wouldn't have that problem as in siled feed then. On the, sorry, on the cherry trees, is just the leaves that's affected? It's the leaves, yeah. So the berries are not a problem? Well, they, I mean, there is that same compound in the pits and stuff too, but they can't eat enough of that. So. But if they get a whole bunch of leaves all at once, like from that wind, if they're nibbling the, the bottom leaves on a tree, that's no big deal. Is that true for like all ruminants, like goats, where they're used to eating leaves more in general, the cherry trees? <sighs> yeah. yeah, I think that they, I think goats, if they could eat a whole bunch of that all at once, that'd be a problem then. But, you know, even if they're standing on their hind feet reaching for those bottom leaves, I just don't think that they can quite get enough to, to be a problem. So. But not apple trees or other cyanide? It really needs, seems to be the, the cherries that the are cherry. the, the real yes. risk there, even though the others have maybe similar compounds in their fruit then. There is a way to test this in the field. There's this uh, kind of litmus paper that, that we can use to, to look for cyanide then. The problem is finding somebody that has it, but I, I'd like to encourage, you know, if you're an extension agent or a seed dealer that, that, uh, that sells a lot of this, to maybe be able to uh, have, have a roll of this on hand because you can do it in the field. You just take a sealed baggie, put a bit of this strip in it, crush or cut up those leaves and leave it in there for 10 minutes, and this will turn purple. This. Uh, in the presence of cyanide, and then you'll know. So this is in the presence, this is uh, cherry leaves that have just been cut up, and you can see how much cyanide is being produced there. So it's a simple test, it's something a farmer shouldn't, you, you don't want to, to buy this paper, but you know, if we can get enough people in the, in the neighborhood that, that maybe have, have it uh, to check it, it, it would be reassuring to not, to not have to worry about it then. Got that? You should have a roll of it, uh, Levi. <laughs> okay, that's it on uh, the prussic acid question. Yeah. Uh, what about some other high diversity impacting these prussic acid? Um, the other one is you know, eating uh, different plants, counteracts of these. A dilution factor. There is a dilution factor. So if that, if, but usually these are planted. 
if not, e even in a diverse mix then that has, you know, maybe some soybean, some, it, it, they're probably gonna be able to eat too much of that sorghum. Uh, we're not gonna get enough of a dilution uh, in that kind of a stand. Th those tend to be the dominant plants in those, even in those mixes then, yeah. Grass tetany, um, so early in the spring, again, usually on annual forages, then we'll get an imbalance uh, uh, of, uh, of all the minerals and we can actually get a magnesium deficiency. And it looks a lot like uh, milk fever uh, because magnesium contributes to muscle function. Um, and usually way, the way we'll see it is you'll treat an animal for milk fever and they don't respond. Um, but keep that in mind that it's uh, uh, a possibility then. You can treat it with uh, magnesium oxide boluses if they're not uh, too far down. Uh, it might be a time to call the vet and have them IV it. Uh, one thing about the grass tetany when you're treating these animals, uh, as, they, as they start to recover, they can be a bit belligerent then. Um, so they, they may uh, be aggressive and surprise you then. So. Uh, Again, this is a pretty specific problem. It tends to be more of a problem in areas where they do a lot of grazing of wheat. So kind of Texas, Oklahoma, they think about it a lot more than we do then, but it's a possibility. Again, early in the spring on super lush forages. Is that something that maybe would be avoided if that's a magnesium deficiency if you had like a free choice mineral? If they're, if they're getting good mineral nutrition, it makes it a lot less likely to then. That's right. Yeah, you, again, usually we see it when they're turned on a big, a big wheat field, maybe not much access to a, a free choice mineral. So yeah, it's, it's very, very preventable then. <clears throat> um, so we're switching gears a little bit. And it's a good segue the importance of having good mineral nutrition out there. I like to have just one mix and use uh, sodium cl chloride, regular salt, to drive the intake of everything else. And I, I'm not usually such a fan of this system. Uh, a single mix makes it simple and ensures that they're, they're getting uh, all the traces too. And the one thing I like to remind people is uh, the, the rumen microbes need these minerals too and they don't have access to body stores of the animals so it's nice even though you may think that uh, you know that your animals have gotten enough of the trace minerals and they maybe don't need them all all the time those microbes uh, could probably benefit from a, a steady supply of uh, of traces as well That's right, that's a problem. So um, a animals have a, a, a need and a drive for sodium chloride, taking up sodium chloride, and to a, a lesser extent, uh, calcium and phosphorus then. Um, I know Fred Provenza's work gets cited a lot then that you know, animals will show a preference if they're deficient in phosphorus or calcium for, for those. Uh, so we, that is uh, less powerful, but salt is, is what's powerful. So if you provide just a salt or a salt block, and then you've got your phosphorus uh, and trace mineral mix here. Now, unless, unless that's palatable enough for the animals to eat it, and that's not reliable, you may develop deficiencies even though you've got it in the pasture. So it's better to combine those into one mix. Let's use that predictable uh, appetite for sodium chloride to bring everything else along for the ride we know that they're getting it all then having more than one mineral mix out there is a recipe for developing deficiencies that you may not suspect then so yeah i've used feeder, or mineral feeders with those rubber flaps on and had a lot of pink guy problems oh is that right Any i mean it's it's yeah potentially if they had a sharp edge or they're using it wrong Anything that irritates the eye in the middle of the summer could could uh, be an aggravating factor for pink That's eye. Then they could too, too, just like face flies <coughs> spread it from animal to animal. That flap could spread it from animal to animal too. That, yeah. yeah. I seem to have a problem with overconsumption of mineral for my cattle, where I've started to limit what they're eating because they eat too much. So it's been suggested that I offer salt 
along with the mineral mix? Is that something that you would agree with? or? Um, I, I still use, I mean, again, the salt is really predictable how much they're going to eat then. Um, you know, and so if, if you think that they're getting too much, you know, calcium phosphorus or trace minerals along with that, I would lower the amount of those those minerals within your mix okay. then, okay. rather than separate so them. Customize the mix then. Customize the mix okay. then, yes. And that's one thing, you work, work with a nutritionist at least initially, test your feeds, test your water also, and, and create a mix. It doesn't need to be changed. Uh, you know, maybe you just set it once for your entire life, um, and that's good enough for your particular farm and water and everything. We were in the free choice one, like the lower picture, we just don't have it on the wheels because we've got short cattle. But, uh, and they got a lighter cover, so it doesn't take as much effort to pick it up. Yeah. And we noticed that, you know, depending on where we got them, they're going to certain varieties more. But in the wintertime, when we're feeding them hay, we can tell when we got hay from, that we brought onto the farm where it came from so that we can see more absorption of certain minerals. But I know. They, they, they go through what they need, so. Or what we hope that they need. I, I think that this is, just because we see variation throughout the year, which you would, it doesn't mean they're necessarily getting what they need. This is my opinion then, so um, I'm, I'm less of a fan of them then, so, yeah. When you say force-fed minerals, are you talking just soil fertility? So force-fed means we're, we're putting it into the feed, into a grain mix, into a TMR, and, and they're eating it with the rest of their feed then. So on pasture, that's not much of an option, you know, unless, again, milking cows and you're feeding grain uh, daily or a supplemental, uh, a partial mixed ration. That's what force-fed means. Free choice. This gets confusing. Some people think they'll call this free choice. I prefer to call this cafeteria style then. But free choice means what we're using uh, sodium chloride to drive the intake, and they eat it as they need sodium chloride. So then it's a mix at that time? This is a mix. That's right. It's a single mix. We've got everything that we need in there. Plus the sodium. And we're using the salt to... to so if you, if you need uh, calcium and phosphorus, it's in there. If your soils uh, are high enough and your feed is bringing on a lot, enough calcium and phosphorus, then you don't need to have that in there. So this, if you need calcium and phosphorus, this, this may be 50% salt, and calcium and phosphorus and all the traces make up the other 50%. If you didn't need calcium and phosphorus, those are macro minerals, this may be 90 plus percent just salt with a few trace minerals in it then. But we can customize this um, you know, for, for the farm. Most farms can use something off the shelf, but sometimes we need something that's customized then too. But I, I prefer to have it all in there. And another way we can use this is for kelp feeding too. Uh, kelp uh, has, its, has its uses. Um, but the problem is that it uh, it's, can be very palatable, it's, it's expensive, and so animals will eat more than they need then. Um, and so how to limit their intake of kelp? Well, we can put that in with the salt, and we can regulate kelp intake as well then. So we can customize uh, our, salt, our salt mix for the summertime uh, by blending our kelp in with it then. So just speaking about kelp in general, uh, it's a great source of kelp, and, and using it as uh, a source of trace minerals is not, not a great idea. It does have trace minerals in it. They're not predictable, um, and so it can be a problem. And then also iodine levels. Um, if people are feeding lots of uh, uh, kelp, we can get uh, dangerous levels of iodine in, in milk in particular. Then I don't know about uh, in the meat then, but... Uh, I know that there's been studies where people have taken uh, cartons of milk off the shelf in the summertime and found problematic levels of iodine in the milk then. So uh, it turns out, at least as far as we know so far, that uh, one of the benefits of kelp is it, is it reduces inflammation and it lowers cortisol levels in, in cows that are eating it then. And we can get that effect with just two to four ounces of kelp a day then. And so you think about 
the times when we might, might want to reduce inflammation in our animals, it's around calving time. Uh, it's really beneficial in uh, young stock during, during the uh, grazing season for face fly prevention. It does seem to, uh, to work pretty well for that. If we're moving, uh, weaning, something like that, it, it's a really good time to, to incorporate it. And it kind of it reduces the cost of kelp too. We don't need to feed it all the time or all summer long. We can kind of target which animals and what times of year we're using it then. Not knowing enough, what's cortisol? What is that? It's stress hormone. When we talk about uh, the problems that stress causes, it's this cortisol. It's uh, released when, when the body is stressed then. And, and it uh, help, kind of helps tamp that down then. All right. uh, animal genetics, uh, more important in dairy cattle and, and maybe sheep. Beef cattle have been pretty well selected and are adapted to, to grazing then. Uh, but in dairy cattle, a lot of health problems that we get take, come from taking <coughs> conventional uh, dairy genetics and putting them on pasture. There's a lot of uh, adaptations that haven't happened there, so using animals adapted and bred on uh, pasture is, is really important. Uh, in sheep world, if you're taking uh, club lamb genetics and putting them out on pasture, uh, you may be disappointed with the results as well then. So animal genetics does contribute to health. Um, and again, these, uh, you know, this looks like uh, just Jersey cows, conventional Jersey cows, but these are actually, a, this is a farm that's been using New Zealand Jersey genetics, and these are really, really well adapted. This is a grass-fed herd, um, not getting a lot of energy uh, from grain or anything, and they've just got excellent body condition, excellent reproduction. Yeah. Question, um, so my, we do AI, so should we be always trying to, and we're not, we're not there, we're just beef? Beef, yeah. So if I'm purchasing the bull semen, does it matter so much that it's got a good grass genetic as much as the cow is the one that's having the calf? Probably not, not so much then. I mean, these bulls are a lot, they're proven on, on grain in a feedlot, but they're out of cows that are, you know, on pasture all the time, so it's less of an issue in, in beef then, unless you're you know unless you're trying to control frame size or something like that. But you're not going to get into a situation probably where these are not they're you know they're being fed grain all the time. And they're not adapted to it, so it's less of a problem in beef, and I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, as long as the mother's on grass all the That's time. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Same with sheep. So these are mine, and uh, these you guys are just coming off the of pasture. They, uh, but if you took a Suffolk club lamb, they wouldn't look nearly the same then. Okay. Uh, this is really useful and important then. So uh, I use it all the time too. Um, and having a, having a diagnosis and, and, and having an idea of what you're going to look for, I mean, all this information is right at our fingertips now. But there's a lot of crap too that is available at our fingertips too. So. Try to, try to pick reliable sites, avoid discussion lists at all costs then, because you're just going to get anecdote after anecdote and you're just going to get sent down this rabbit hole. But, but there's a ton of good information and um, there's unfortunately not enough vets that you know, are serious about uh, grazing and raising animals on pasture. And if you happen to have a vet that uh, isn't into it, um, they can, uh, they can still help you. Um, the fact that they don't know or understand uh, grazing uh, the same way that you hope that they would doesn't mean that they can't give you a diagnosis then. So they can help you send in samples, they can diagnose the animal uh, for you, and then maybe then you can go to Dr. Google or call somebody who does uh, uh, know it, but. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they can still be of help even if they're grousing the whole time about how you, you'd be better off uh, not grazing cows then. So, but still use them anyway if you, if you need a diagnosis then. Okay, pink eye is the next thing I get, you know, starting the end of July or so, it's just, it's continuous pink eye. So there's a lot of misconceptions that I'd like uh, to, to try to help uh, explain uh, initially, 
this, this is the eye that uh, we want to treat then. Uh, but we, we seldom get to treat this eye. What we end up getting uh, treating is, is the one that's already quite far along in the disease then. So uh, we want to see, we want to treat them when they're, the eye is watery, when it's red, before it's clouded over, when it's painful. Uh, we'll get to that more later then. Uh, options, we can, uh, we can spray uh, various uh, Boom sprays, this, uh, this chlorine um, treatment, or, or antibiotics then. The thing about pink eye, the bacteria that's on the surface of the eye is quite easy to kill then. Uh, so if we can use any kind of a topical or systemic antibiotic, uh, we can usually clear that up, but then the eye has to go through a, a healing process. The thing I think is way underused is the eye patch then. So if you do a single topical treatment with any of those uh, products I showed you, and then put an eye patch on, you're, you're good to go then. You don't really need to retreat them at all then. But again, we're treating that early eye. So eye patches can be the commercial ones. You can cut out patches uh, of, of canvas or denim yourself and glue them on. The thing to remember when you're using an eye patch though is don't put glue on that bottom of the eye patch. We still want air circulation and we want drainage out of there then too. So don't glue it all the way around, but, but this is uh, way underused and incredibly useful then. So how long do you leave that on for? Uh, usually until it falls off, but you know, even if it seems like if you can get even just get five days worth uh, on there, five days, two weeks, that's long enough to, to, to uh, get things where we need to go then. Not completely healed, but. Because we use that spray that you had there that. Yeah. And there we just go out and maybe do it twice a day on a, mm -hmm. on a regular basis. We go out with two bottles, so we'll get it from one side to the other when they try to turn our direction. Okay, yeah. It's, and that's, I mean, you, you can spray them in the, if you can, if you've got dairy cows and they're coming into the barn twice a day, easy to treat topically and you don't need to worry about this. But if, if you've got beef cattle, if you've got heifers, um, yeah. then this eye patch is incredibly useful then. What type of glue do we need? Usually a rubber cement. Um, some, sometimes if you've got animals that really want to uh, chew on those or pull on them or rub them, um, some people will go to the extreme of uh, construction adhesive, but then you've got to, uh, then you've got to remove it yourself then too. If you're using rubber, rubber cement, it'll fall off on its own. Pink eye is caused by, well, maybe we'll get to that when I talk about vaccination then. So uh, again, this is, uh, this is when we want to treat them then, when you see this. Uh, what, you see a watery eye, they're squinting in the sunlight, that eye is painful, now's the time to get them in. Too often, this, as a vet, this is when they call. Well, there's nothing I can do here then. It, it already passed the acute phase. And that eye is just going through its healing process. There's nothing, you can give them a shot at uh, LA200 or do a treatment then, but it's, it's uh, just placebo for the, for the farmer then. So this eye, it looks horrible, but she's holding it open. She's comfortable. It's, there's no drainage. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything for this particular animal then. Just let the healing uh, proceed then. Um, this is one that needs to be treated. Uh, we've got lots of uh, drainage here, it's painful. And then you can see if you look at these eyes closely, uh, in this particular animal we've got a thinning of the, uh, of the surface of the eye there. And when we get permanent blindness is when that eye ruptures then. And so we've got uh, a thinning here, um, and that's maybe when you can call, call that they can suture that third eyelid across there, provide some support and aid in the healing then. So if you've got that thin spot, um, that's, that's probably when it's time to call that and get a little extra help for that animal then. This doesn't take long if you've got a decent way of holding their head and catching them. And this is what happens if you don't do that then. So this is a grisly picture of a ruptured eyeball. She'll, she'll never look see out of that again. And if you did have that ruptured eyeball and it's a valuable animal, um, removing the eye entirely is an option too then. So this is not a difficult surgery. Um, 
and so that's an option too. See how nicely that's healed over? So it, it, is, it is an option rather than leaving it bad. Okay, uh, so the things that cause pink eye, uh, irritants, flies, dust. I think seed heads get blamed a little bit too much then. Uh, UV light is an incredible irritant to eyes though. And so um, providing some source of shade during hot weather is, is important then. Um, for face flies, uh, this seems to be working a lot. More people are doing this, putting the sticky traps on a barrel, on a piece of plywood, and putting it right above the waterer. When that animal lowers their head into the waterer, the face flies tend to, to jump off and they land on there and you can catch quite a few and reduce population over time. Uh, this looks ridiculous, but if, um, you know, it, it actually makes a lot of sense. These are uh, horse uh, eye, eye protections. Um, if we're gonna vaccinate for it, there's, uh, uh, pink eye vaccines sort of have a bad reputation because they are always, uh, the old ones were always to one species, Moraxella bovis, but it turns out there was another really prevalent bacteria that caused it called Moraxella vivoculi. And now finally we have a commercial uh, variation of this. One day they'll get approval to, to mix these two together, but right now they're separate, so you've got to give two different shots. And I would use these vaccines on animals that you're taking to the back 40 and treatment is just really not gonna happen if, it, if they do get pink eye. So reserve <laughs> these vaccines for animals that you, you can't catch or do anything with. No, you, you have to give two shots. Yeah, you can't mix it. I, you know, I don't know, but I, I Larry, would you mix them? Yeah, if you had a lot, you could have your own vaccine made to your own one. But I, I, they just, I don't know. I don't know if that. I don't know if the adjuvants would interfere with each other, but I just, I don't feel so comfortable doing that then. Uh, you don't get cross immunity between the different strains. Yeah. And so if you've got a different strain on your farm, mm -hmm. you're wasting your money on either one of those vaccines. Yeah. You've got to have an autogenous, and it will work in a cow calf. Yeah. But if you have a soccer operation, it doesn't work because you're bringing these calves up in so many different places, and yeah. you've got many different strains. Right. And the stra they don't cross into you. Yeah. So don't waste your money. I spent like ten thousand dollars for my one year mm -hmm. doing an autogenous vaccine, and we, we did a hundred different cultures in the south. Uh -huh. When they came to Wisconsin that year, they had three shots, mm. and you still had more drink out of your brother. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, maybe most people know a better answer, too, but are they ever, we do have an autogenous Mycoplasma is really hard to get an, any kind of immune response to then, so it's that's going to be tricky to, to do that. So we're kind of limited with, right now, with vaccinating for the more Excellus at this point. So on the, I, everyone tells me I'm going to have a pink eye problem, but I've had cow cat for seven years now with the grass and I've never had pink eye. Yeah. So is there, if I never have it, Am I less, I mean, in other words, once I have it, I'm probably going to have it every year or not necessarily? Not necessarily then. So, yeah, like, they, they move around. Uh, they may come from a neighboring herd. There may be, so uh, it, in some cases that, in some disease processes, that's true, but I don't think in your case it's true then. So, whatever, so there's, there's three components to getting pink eye or like any disease is susceptibility to the animals. Uh, are you, the conditions, so 
Are they getting lots of exposure to UV light, to flies? And if you're able to reduce that pressure, you, you greatly reduce the amount of uh, chance of getting disease. And then the last thing is just having the organism. So the organism by itself doesn't necessarily cause disease. <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you're you're not gonna you're not safe just with if your farm is there because face flies or whatever can move around that. Yep. With a bunch of animals, say on a grazing or or whatever, what would a how would a particular animal present? Like, you know, if I can't get up close to look on both sides of every yeah cattle that comes through the you know that's on the way to the next paddock or something like that. Do, do they exhibit any behaviors? Do they isolate? Do they shake their heads? Do, is there anything I can look for without getting an up-close inspection of every eye? Yeah, you can see them squinting from a distance. Squinting. When you're moving them, you know, they may be at the back because they just can't quite see as well. They'll be the slower ones to move then. Okay. So, yeah, there's, there's ways to pick them out then, so. Yeah, you want to do it as close. These uh, these vaccines don't have the immunity that doesn't last very long, and so you know doing it in April or May, kind of timing it, not even for the grazing season, but more for when the face flies are going to start to come out or when the sun gets really bright then too. So May is a nice time if you can do it then. All right, we better move on here. Uh, and there's no pink eye available for vaccines available for small ruminants, even though they do get it then. Parasites. We this is uh, this is huge. Then, um, uh, and and so the, a couple of points here, real quick. Parasites are part of the normal microbiome. Then, so don't get away from thinking if I could just get rid of these parasites, these worms, uh, my life would be easy from here on out. It's it's just never going to happen. They're 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 just part of they're just part of this uh, whole system of uh, what a ruminant is. Then, uh, but we can use. Uh, efforts to control parasites to make our grazing better then. And, um, and there's really no other treatment. You can, you can, you've all heard about parasite resistance to the dewormers that we have, um, and multiple, multiple treatments are just not, never going to be uh, what we need to do. So we need to combine knowledge of this life cycle with how we graze. So the, the adults live in the uh, intestines or the fourth stomach, the abomasum, of our, uh, uh, of our animals, uh, they feed on the animal and produce eggs. So all these, these animals, the adults live here, the eggs are laid into the manure, and then uh, depending on how warm and humid things are, those eggs hatch within the manure and crawl out onto the grass and crawl up the grass blades and uh, looking to, to infect the next animal. So this can happen in as little as three to 10 days. Um, and so how do we do that? We, we don't leave animals on a particular paddock for more than two days then, uh, which is what we shouldn't be doing anyway. A day is, is good enough. So if we're, if we're keeping animals moving, if we're thinking about nutrition and uh, feed quality, we're gonna avoid uh, infect, infection from those newly hatched uh, larvae. Uh, the other thing to remember is uh, once they form, these larvae form that infective stage, they crawl up on the, on the leaf blades, but they're kind of exposed up there to, to drying and sunlight. And so they form this coating around them that keeps them from being able to feed anymore. And so they've just got to survive long enough until an animal comes and eats them. They've only got so much energy in them before they would die. And so if we can uh, in increase our rest periods uh, up to 40 to 45 days, we'll get a 90% reduction in the number of these infective larvae uh, on, on our pastures then. So not 100%, uh, 90% then. And if you go longer, or if you can alternate this with a, a, a cutting of hay, then you can, you can really reduce it to practically to zero with a cutting of hay then. How does the hay cutting? What does that do? It removes 
it removes those infective larvae with oh, the hay gosh. then. Yep. The, and then they, the they die. Yeah, They die as you, when you, after you harvest it. How about the too. clipping that you talked about uh, earlier? They could still be on the, the grasses okay. then. Yeah. That, that's not long enough. That's not long enough, yeah. They could still be sitting on there. Uh, the other thing is that most of those infective larvae, they don't want to crawl above four inches off the ground. I mean, there'll be some of them above higher than that, depending if it's a really wet uh, time and they could crawl up above. But most of them are going to be in the bottom four inches. So the four inches, four to six inches of residual, just like uh, is, is uh, recommended for uh, great, good grazing practices too. So good grazing is, uh, is uh, parasite control. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, moving animals and, and rest periods. You can graze successfully with set stocking. Uh, it just is rarely done because the stocking rate needs to be low enough to, to allow these grasses to flourish then. So usually you're looking like half an animal an acre, and that's usually not a, a tolerable stocking rate. So that's why people usually say that this doesn't work, but if you had a low enough stocking rate, you could make it work, because animals will, if given the choice, they will keep moving around a paddock then. Uh, this is what it looks like. So these are, these are lamb grazing uh, uh, forage that's been uh, rested long enough. Uh, and we've left a, a residual here, so even grazing small ruminants who are more susceptible to these parasites uh, can work if we get the grazing right. Is there any known like um, predatory like insects or something like that for parasites? Yeah. Um, so that's that's uh, this is what we look for: uh, anemia, in, uh, especially in humongous, uh, in sheep and goats that can actually kill them. So we look for. Uh, uh, loss of body condition and loose manure. Um, what do you see. look for in cattle? Loose manure and, and loss of body condition. Okay. But in cattle, it doesn't normally no kill them. Right it's now. more of an economic. Uh, it's more of an economic problem. Uh, so you talked about parasites for them. Uh, this is what's available right now. This bioworma. So it's a fungus that, that uh, attacks and kills those larvae in the manure. Um, the thing to remember is that it only does this in the manure, so it's only in this phase of it. So there's going to be some uh, parasites that escape the manure without uh, getting uh, killed by this fungus, and they're still going to crawl onto the grass and be infective. Then, so uh, it's not it's not like you're seeding your entire uh, pasture with it. Then, and it works best for people that just have like a small a small number of animals on a small lot where they're just always potentially nibbling, and then it's nice for reducing it. But on a big scale, this is too expensive and not effective enough. Um, let's see, real quick. Wrap it up. Yeah, I know, yeah. Um, this has been a really <laughs> great session on lots of questions. Lots of questions, lots of questions, yeah. I, I think we're needing to recommend that this session be continued and repeated I, I don't think you got through what fifty percent of what you were. I was getting close. Getting close. Getting close. <laughs> well, the, the kind of questions. I think we just have a, a super idea here with this session. I want to repeat it, and uh, I'm going to ask you to let you take thirty seconds to fill the audience in on this big change coming in June regarding antimicrobials oh, and okay. veterinary client patient relationships, I think it's really important for this group to understand. Would you take a few minutes, Dr. Griffin? Yeah, to I, that? and I probably don't, I'm not practicing anymore, so I don't have quite the same understanding of it, but essentially what the FDA has done, and we've kind of known that this was coming down the road, is that uh, we've become accustomed to being able to walk into Farm and Fleet and buy LA-200, penicillin, and a certain number of grandfathered drugs in. Over the, counter over the counter drugs then. It's going to be done. Yep, and so you'll no longer be able to do that without a prescription. Even the things that you've become accustomed to just go, walking in and getting, you can no longer do that. And the way you get a prescription is you have to have a relationship with your local veterinarian, no matter how ornery they might be then. Um, <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's going to be a hurdle we have to cross. And it, it, there's going to be a lot of resentment because of that. You'll have to, it'll require the vet to come uh, visit your farm and be, at least become acquainted with your operation before they can write that prescription then. And so, you know, rather than just purely resenting it, 
is there something that they can do for you while they're there? Think up questions, um, ask about vaccines. Be creative. Be creative. Uh, make them work for it. Um, don't make them just, don't let them just come in there and sign a piece of paper then. So, but it is coming down the road and um, if you've not heard about it, um, eventually you're gonna, you might bump into it then. So am I missing any parts of that, the vet people here uh, that I should have mentioned then? Or, okay. Can I include anything like antibiotics or anything? Any antibiotics then. Uh, aspirin probably is still uh, uh, you know, free from that too as well, but any antibiotic now from Let's show our appreciation for that. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, I know there was some background noise and a little, I did the very best I can um, as, uh, because of the, some of the questions I know were hard to hear. Uh, so I imagine you kind of worked around that. But I thank you very much for your time and have a most wonderful evening.